And um, people will be people will be coming in and coming out. Uh, people will email me saying they're coming late. They're rushing to get here, but they've got other obligations. I think people have to school off before certain hours. Our plan is as we will go not to 5:30, um, but to about a quarter to five. Um, and will be our, our our general idea. And we'll see how how people are doing. Um, I am John Brooke. I am the uh, um, the director of the, what do we call, what do we call ourselves, the, the Center for Historical Research at Ohio State University, that's what we call ourselves. And we are in the closing semester of our two-year series on health, disease, and environment and global history. Um, and um, we are extremely thrilled to have a, a massive panel of, of experts on, on um, disease in Africa here today um, to, to begin this process of uh, well, actually, I, I will say Bruce Campbell began the process of winding down the series, but, but um, uh, this is one of the great events of the year, if not the two years. Um, so let me, I'm going to do a full-scale introduction, and then I'm going to sit down and do a little bit of um, uh, orchestration later on, but as I, I assume that five of you will orchestrate pretty well. Um, but I'm going to do my introductions right off the bat. Um, it roughly, in, in comments, I assume that you know the order that however you guys want to do it, but I'm going to introduce Mari first of all, but Julie, and then I'll introduce commentators, and then I'll sit down. Mari Weeble is our, um, potentially our first presenter. Um, she is presently a postdoctoral fellow in African Studies and Global Health at Emory. She is a 2012 Columbia PhD, where she wrote a dissertation titled Borderlands of Research, Empire of Medicine, Empire, and Sleeping Sickness in East Africa, 1901 to 1914. Um, and her paper today, Land Fevers, Researchers, and Elusive Patients, Perspectives on Sleeping Sickness Control in East Africa, draws upon this research and developments. Um, Julie Livingston um, got a PhD at Emory. Uh, in 2001, and associate <coughs> professor presently in of history at Rutgers, is the author of, um, co-editor of various books, but author of two books, uh, one, Debility in the Moral Imagination in Botswana, uh, published by Indiana in 2005, um, and presently um, uh, forthcoming in press, out of out Rushed to Done, finished, available to be purchased. Um, improvising medicine in an African oncology ward, uh, coming from Duke University Press uh, to your Amazon sites as we speak. Um, and many of you can order right now before the end of the day. Uh, before we leave, I expect at least how many orders? How many, how many of you are there? <laughs> <laughs> you just give me your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a little right. tighter on your cell phone. Okay, so our commentators, we have a, a panoply of commentators of a long experience in um, issues in medicine and Africa. Uh, and uh, in or, well, first I want to introduce Alan Morris, who is a professor of applied anatomy and biological anthropology at the University of Cape Town, and has been spending a year at uh, OSU in the Department of Anthropology, um, working on um, paleobiology, I guess, paleobiology. Miller Group in um, the Department of Anthropology. Um, our two OSU commentators are leaders of the OSU Eastern Africa uh, One Health Summer Institute, most recently uh, conducted in July of uh, July, I assume the summer of 2012, um, which is a major piece of OSU's uh, outreach in applied medicine in, um, on, in Africa. Um, they're offering professional field training in molecular, molecular epidemiology, um, infectious diseases, foodborne diseases, epidemiology, zoonotic diseases, um, how the question of, of animal uh, human vectors, which was a huge problem uh, worked out, worked on by um, uh, by Bruce Campbell in his talk on the Black Death about um, how it feels like about two years ago. But it was actually only about five weeks ago. Um, Michael, Michael Bassesi works in uh, environmental and occupational health science and is the senior associate um, dean for academic affairs and chair of the division of environmental health sciences in the College of Public Health. And Wanderson Gabreis 
uh, works broadly and specifically, really, on you know, animal, animal vector, and foodborne pathogens in the Horn of Africa. Um, and he is the director of global health programs in the OSU College of Veterinary Medicine. So I want to welcome all of you, all five of you, um, and tell me when you'd like me to pick this thing up and put it down. And, but other than that, I will, I will step aside and other than occasional kind of uh, grunts from my end and questions, I'm going to leave the floor to you all. Um, so um, I'm Mary Wavell, um, and I'm going to take just a few minutes um, to talk uh, about the, the sort of space in which, or, or place in which we can situate um, the, the piece that you read for today, um, which is on gland healers, on these gland healers, and on the patients they were looking for, and on their um, social and political context in northwestern Tanzania before the First World War. Um, and what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, about how this fits into the to the broader project, and then also talk about how I think it fits into um, to a certain extent to, to Julie's work, which has been very influential on my own, um, but also to the broader conversations that we can have about global health and about um, about zoonotic diseases, about vector-borne diseases in the present day. So, what do gland feelers who are operating in a tiny corner of northwestern Tanzania a hundred years ago have to do with the elimination of sleeping sickness as a neglected tropical disease in the present day? Um, I have some ideas and some suggestions about that, and I hope that's something we might address and talk about over the course of the seminar. Um, so, uh, so the paper that you read is about the sleeping sickness isolation camp in a, in a village called Kiarama in northwestern Tanzania, and a group of men that German doctors called gland feelers, or Tlusenfuller, which literally means gland feelers. Again, it's very, very descriptive, direct. And they circulate from the camp at Kiarama in, the, um, in, in this kingdom of Kiziba in the early 20th century. Um, these two things come into being because of epidemic sleeping sickness um, and because of sleeping sickness epidemics that strike the Lake Victoria region in the first 20 years of the 20th century. Um, between 250 and 300,000 people die in those first two decades, um, estimated at the Lake Victoria region. Um, a, a, a concomitant um, epidemics in the Congo Basin kill uh, around an estimated 500,000 people. Those are rough estimates um, of, how, of mortality from the disease. But it was, um, it was uh, difficult to say catastrophic. It was incredibly serious at the time. Um, sleeping sickness is a debilitating disease. It is an agonizing death. Um, I've had people come up to me before and say, man, I have sleeping sickness. I got so tired in that talk the other day. And I always just want to say, no, no, you don't. You don't. And you couldn't get it. You couldn't get it in the present day because you aren't uh, a poor African farmer living in the tsetse belt. But more, more to the point that it's, it sounds innocuous because everybody needs their sleep, but it's not. Um, and so that's just something to drive home from the get-go. Um, the context for the, these gland feelers and, and the work that they're doing is that um, with, this, with this epidemic in the Lake Victoria region, um, colonial administrators and African authorities alike kick into to high gear in responding to the epidemic. Um, Imperial Tropical Medicine Networks mobilize to, um, to launch research expeditions that crisscross uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in the first 20, 10 years or so of the 20th century. And, um, and African kings and, and healers and, and a variety of people <coughs> within the affected areas also kick into gear, sometimes reaching out to missionary clinics, sometimes reaching out and working with, um, with colonial authorities, and in other ways uh, coping with this, this disruption to politics and society in, in, in their own ways. Um, one of the things that happens to, to set this, these gland feelers into motion is that, uh, is that the, the king of Kiziba at the time, in 1907, reaches out to the German authorities, or that the German authorities reach out to the king. It depends on who your narrator is. And that, and that back and forth is something that I think is really interesting in thinking about how, um, how a, a campaign that we would normally understand from a, really a bird's eye view. So when we talk about colonial public health, we have a sense of, of stations being here and a cordon sanitaire being set up here and a, and a real uh, a sort of wider map of this, maybe a regional map, maybe a national map, but we very rarely or have not yet done very much to settle ourselves into the place in which these campaigns occur and look at the, the social and political context for them. So, so this discussion of the gland feelers is an effort to do that um, and to look at why exactly, what kind of stakes are involved in people um, participating in um, taking advantage of colonial biomedicine, um, how exactly auxiliaries 
are looped into these, these new um, public health structures, how they become new kinds of colonial functionaries. Um, and the stories of these land dealers and their sought after charges is, is one where we see colonial authority stretching into new areas and asserting new claims to control and to surveil and to heal. Um, it's a situation where we see new geographies of power and healing layered onto pre-existing ones that still have uh, a strong relevance for people who are living in a kingdom like Kaziba. Um, and not to take up too, too much time, I'll talk a little bit about sort of where this fits in for me into um, where this, where I think this research can, can take us um, presently. Um, and, and for my part, I think a lot about sleeping sicknesses as an NTD. Um, these neglected tropical diseases have been identified um, and selected and marked for elimination or eradication by 2015 or 2020. Um, it's, uh, there's an incredible amount of energy going into this um, right now. Uh, I've, when I started to hear about the, the NTD push and, and, and was reading some of the primary source documents that, are, that were created within the last year, I thought I must have missed something. You know, sleeping sickness has not been on the radar in the same way. It has for Doctors Without Borders, it has for, obviously, for, um, for African health administrations, but it hasn't been on the global scale. What did I miss? And the answer is that I didn't actually miss anything. It's happening as we speak. Um, and there's been an incredible acceleration of attention to NTDs in the last couple of years that is much more programmatic and, um, and goal-driven than I think it was in years past. So, um, so this history of gland feelers and thinking about gland feelers and public health in Kaziba gives us some history for recent, recent developments in humanitarian aid and global health. Um, a context for thinking about um, thinking about uh, community participation, what exactly community participation means and how it functions. Um, how do large-scale programs look from the perspective of the people who are their subjects, rather than from NGOs or from a national health administration or a regional regional health service? Um, and they, I think it also provides a context for thinking about about partnership. If we know that the success of public health depends on community participation and buy-in, this isn't the way that, that a lot of things are being structured right now, how exactly does that buy-in happen? Um, and, and how does it happen in ways that might be unexpected? And what are the social and political consequences of it? Um, and, and how can those be much longer running than, uh, than might have been intended? Um, I also want to, to flag that I think that, that thinking about uh, sleeping sickness in the Lake Victoria region, um, as opposed to thinking about only a Tanzanian history of sleeping sickness, um, does a lot of work to, to retain a sense of connectivity and mobility within that region that is lost when we are operating only at the level of the modern nation state, um, particularly in areas on borders like this one that I'm studying the history of. Um, the, the most relevant political capital is not <coughs> Dar es Salaam, is not the coast of Tanzania, it's, it's Kampala, it's Uganda. And, um, and I think by, by looking at this epidemiological zone and this ecological zone, we can understand better historically um, who exactly the relevant players were for people living at the time. And then lastly, I think that um, I'm, I'm very excited about, um, about new directions in the history of medical research, and particularly medical research that's happening in, in East Africa. Julie's work is, is a big part of that. There's also really interesting work on, on the history of medical research in East Africa. Um, Tanzania and Kenya and Uganda are hotbeds of medical research. Um, and uh, and we are we are new histories are and new ethnographic studies and anthropology are being written about how exactly these processes are unfolding, what that encounter of research means in the provision of care, um, and also in um, in how people understand themselves to be subjects in different ways. And uh, and I think that other parts of my work speak more strongly to this than the gland feelers, but we can see how um, how exactly those dynamics have a much much earlier history. Than, than I think we would otherwise think. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. I was afraid I might go on too long, so I'd rather that. Understand. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank John for organizing us. He worked really, really hard. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, the piece that I gave you guys to read is a chapter from my book that just came out called Improvising Medicine. Uh, the book is an ethnography of Botswana's one and only cancer ward um, and its associated clinic, where I did research on and off between 2006 and 2010. And the chapter that I gave you to read is the second <coughs> one in the book, the one that tries to situate the oncology that I was witnessing on a daily basis 
in a broader historical and to some extent regional context. This chapter is consciously written as a history of the present. I think I'm probably an apologist here. I didn't realize you'd be an anthropologist, so I'm not. But when I wrote this, I didn't realize that. Um, the only anthropologist this year in your series at the History Center, so my work might read a little differently in how it's explicitly driven by very contemporary and even future-oriented concerns. So obviously, history that's written from the back moving forward is going to take up slightly different questions than history that's written from the front looking backward. And this is very self-consciously the front looking backward. I hope somebody else comes and writes from the back moving forward. Um, and there's a, a PhD student at UPenn, Marissa Mika, who's going to do that at the Uganda um, Cancer Institute. Um, taking a cue from Solzhenitsyn's, what I think was really remarkable novel about a post-Stalinist cancer ward in Tashkent, my book follows Botswana's 20-bed cancer ward as both a metaphor for, but also an instantiation of the constellation of bureaucracy, vulnerability, power, biomedical science, mortality, politics, and hope that shaped 21st century experience in the Southern African region. And at the same time, as quite simply, a cancer ward, which is a very powerfully embodied social and existential space, something that I'm sure many people in the room have had experience with as a visitor or as a patient. In the process, the book considers fundamental questions about the political and economic context of healthcare in Africa. The politics of palliation and disfigurement in the global south, the nature of decision making in clinical contexts of great uncertainty, and the social orchestration of hope and futility in an African hospital. The argument in my book has three uh, parts to it. First, I argue that improvisation is a defining feature of biomedicine in Africa. Biomedicine, as I think we all know, is a global system of knowledge and practice, but it is also a highly contextualized pursuit. So everywhere you look, doctors, patients, nurses, and relatives, lab workers, will tailor biomedical knowledge and practice to suit their specific situations. This is another universal of biomedicine. But in hospitals and clinics across Africa, for reasons that have to do with uneven infrastructure, and an uneven <coughs> knowledge base. Clinical improvisation is particularly accentuated. And I hope you could see some of this in the piece that you read, where the knowledge that was being produced was very uncertain. And then the context in which it's being implemented are the same way. One day the x-ray machine is working, the next day it's broken. You don't know when it's going to start again. One day you have cisplatin in stock, the next day you don't, you don't know when it will come back. And these are conditions in which people have to nonetheless treat the patient before them. The second argument is that although cancer produces moments and states of profound loneliness for patients, serious illness, pain, disfigurement, and death are deeply social experiences. So understanding cancer as something that happens between people rather than to a person is critical for grasping its gravity. And in that respect, what I want to make visible in the oncology word of PMH, which is just an acronym for Botswana Central Hospital, is not something that's uniquely African somehow. Instead, I think it's an imperative that's often papered over or under threat in the techno-bureaucratic rituals of an American cancer ward, but which nonetheless is there just beneath the surface if we look for it, and that's care. I understand care within the context of debility and existential crisis as a form of critical, and this is a quote from anthropologist Angela Garcia, because I like the definition, critical sociality based on incommensurate experience. So for one person to take care of another, it doesn't mean that you're on equal footing. Somebody has needs or vulnerabilities, and the other person has expertise or energy that they're applying to it. By paying careful attention to care within this ward, how it's imagined, how it's enacted and distributed, the moments when it succeeds, the many moments when it fails, I present an anthropology of value that conjoins the biopolitical, the ethical, the social, and the human in medicine. 
and not the focus that comes through in other chapters, not the one that you read here for today. Third, this cancer epidemic is one that will profoundly shape the future of global health. It raises fundamental <coughs> policy, scientific, technological, and caregiving challenges for Africans and for the international community alike. Cancer, I argue, from my position in southern Africa, so this is to some extent regional, is a critical phase of African health after antiretrovirals. As such, cancer experiences in this ward expose the unfortunate fact that biomedicine is an incomplete solution. So biomedicine can be redemptive and exacerbate existing health inequalities at the same time. In other words, there is going to be no quick techno fix for African health. And yet, biomedicine functions as a necessary, vital, palliative institution in a historically unjust, unjust world. So you can't just be a therapeutic nihilist about it and throw it out the window because it's not going to fix everything. But one has to handle it in all of its complexity and the ethical questions that it raises. In order to explain what I mean, I just want to orient you very briefly to the broader context. I'm not sure who in this room is a health person, who's a historian, who knows about Africa, so I'm going to give you a bit of background and apologize, apologies to anyone who knows all of what I'm going to tell you. Um, Botswana is a middle income country in southern Africa. It has a population of about 2 million people, but it's the size of France. Sometimes it's called the African Miracle. That's because while it was systematically and deeply impoverished by British colonialism after independence in 1966, Botswana, as citizens of Botswana are called, discovered vast diamond wealth in their country. Vast diamond wealth does not make you a success story. I think we all know that. So the success has to be attributed <laughs> to Botswana and their um, political system. And they have developed and managed that wealth via a stable <coughs> democracy steadily investing their diamond revenue in infrastructure and social services, including universal health care. That said, as you know if you read the paper, there are 2 million in Botswana, in Botswana. There are estimated to be another 2 million people in Botswana right now, and they are Zimbabweans. And they have had to come to Botswana by and large as economic and political migrants who um, find their home country to be untenable right now. So again, when I say universal health care, there are people who are in and there are people who are out. Um, beginning in the mid-90s, Botswana was at the epicenter of the AIDS epidemic in Southern Africa. So there was a lost decade, total existential angst and mourning. I lived in Botswana during um, some of those years, and there was a very widespread uh, experience of illness that could have saturated every home and every workplace. In response to this, the Botswana government partnered with the Gates Foundation and Merck Pharmaceutical virus-associated cancer, one of the genital cancers, Kaposi sarcoma, a lymphoma, head and neck tumor, etc., as they become immunocompromised from the virus. Before they received antiretrovirals, those patients would have died of opportunistic infections, but perhaps with a cancer. Now they're surviving those infections to become a cancer patient. Anticipating this, the Botswana government knew this was coming. It's not a surprising thing. The Ministry of Health um, in 2001, remember the antiretroviral program starts at the beginning of 2002. So in late 2001, knowing that they're going to be producing a cancer epidemic of sorts, the Ministry of Health converted a small piece of PMH, the nation's central referral hospital in the national capital, Kavarone, to a cancer ward, the only such site in the country. As the ward opens and its clinic, you start to get patients with HIV-associated cancers who come in. But at the same time, now that you have oncology services, their existence begins to reveal the substantial burden of other cancers. Women with breast cancer, men with prostate cancer, kids with osteogenic sarcoma, people with leukemia, etc., who've been there all along but previously went undiagnosed because there was no oncology capacity in the country. So if you put those two groups together, you suddenly have the situation of overwhelming proportions. And I'm afraid it is not only in Botswana. Across Africa, in fact, throughout the global south, there is a cancer epidemic that is emerging rapidly. 
currently more than half of all new cancer cases and two-thirds of all cancer deaths occur in the global south. And epidemiologists predict that this tide is going to rise very rapidly uh, for some of the reasons I hope you can um, understand based on the chapter that you read. I just anecdotally can see that rising tide from my tiny little perch in this 20-bed oncology ward in Botswana. So having worked there over the course of four years, every year the pressure on bed space would intensify and the queue of um, patients at the clinic would grow longer. So my book looks at Botswana as a best case scenario of sorts to try to imagine what kinds of questions this new epidemic raises. While at the same time, I look to Botswana's oncology work to resituate some of the master narratives of cancer in this country and in the global north more broadly. I think it's time to do away with the center and periphery model and to understand that there are communities of patients and of knowledge and technologies that move in multiple directions and slide across space in all kinds of complicated ways. So um, I probably talked long enough and I will turn over to our <coughs> Thanks very much, ladies. Uh, before I start anything, I want to say that I read the both, uh, both papers and thoroughly enjoyed them. An excellent job. I'm not going to be critical because I'm a gentleman. I'm not going to be critical because I can't find anything to be seriously critical about. Uh, they're both really excellent papers. What I would like to do is, is perhaps introduce uh, a viewpoint from my side, which is slightly different. Um, Julie, just to, to warn you, I, yes, indeed, I'm an anthropologist of sorts, but I'm a specialist in dead people, so that makes life easier for you. <laughs> but um, uh, what I am is, in fact, I'm a professor in a medical school in South Africa, and I see this even though I'm not a clinician, and I'm, I'm dealing with dead patients rather than living ones, uh, I do work with my colleagues and hear the problems and see the issues, and particularly I'm engaged whether I like it or not, I'm engaged with medical education. So we're seeing issues about how do we train doctors and what are the problems, uh, where, where are we going through And we have recently, in 2002, gone through a complete transformation in how medical students are trained in South Africa. It's a so-called new curriculum style, another seminar, we'll talk about it then. But what is interesting is that South Africa remains an anomaly. Uh, South Africans like to refer to themselves as a first world and third world country combined. Uh, and of course it has its own distinctive history, which you know about Julie talks about briefly in the paper. But what it does is it gives me a viewpoint which is slightly different from the experience that both of you had in Tanzania and in Botswana, uh, yet connecting in many ways. Um, Mari, uh, Mary, I, I read your paper and, and it struck me that the, the, the two things that came up and, and hit me, it's historical paper, uh, of course, so if we were valuing that into modern times, we have to, we have to, that, that's a valid judgment of how, how you do that. But what did strike me was two things. Um, was one, something that fascinated me about medical doctors in the German world and probably the European world at the turn of the 20th century, was the fact that, that they were prepared to push through failed treatments that they knew were not working. And as a scientist, that fascinates me. Because I'm absolutely bowled over when I discover scientists who do things that we're trained not to do. We're told to be good, we're told to be observers. The medical curriculum we've set up in Cape Town, which is based on a world-scale a world scale medical treatment, is of course evidence-based medicine. We're supposed to only make decisions when we have evidence that shows that what decisions we're going to do are going to be valuable. And of course, now we're coming into a very serious problem with scientific snobbery. Scientists do, and as one I will admit it, do think that they are better than other people. They have a, a knowledge that they are going to give out. Um, and I'll tell you a sh short story about UCT in a moment about that. But the other issue was um, the fact that who is chosen to aid from the community, this linkage, this, the nature of community participation has such a major impact. And you brought it out very powerfully about the issues that who these gland feelers were, the context they came from, had implications for how medicine was laid out. And, and I think that's a central issue and it's still going on. 
Two things strike me that, that come up to, to bring it up to modern times in the South African experience. One, um, about the arrogance of scientists, in 1992, the Kellogg Corporation of the United States uh, waived a huge, immense grant um, to South Africans for primary health care to all the medical schools and said, make application, and if your application is good, we'll give you the money. And the team from the University of Cape Town, which was out of the primary health care department there, they thought this was, I think, what Americans call a slam dunk. It's the best university in the country, the one with the best research record, the multiple publications, all the long list. They put in their application, and to their horror, they were given absolutely nothing. And other, other universities, which were much, much less in international ranking, got significant grants. And the problem was that they had never engaged with the communities to ask them what they needed. It was always, we know, and we're going to give it to you. And that's what I was seeing in your paper from the German context. Um, linked to that is something that's very real in South Africa right now, which is a, a very small uh, problem which has a tremendous potential for disaster. It's the presence of, presence of something called XDR-TB, extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis. For those of you who are unaware, the Western Cape of South Africa, where I come from, has the world's highest level of tuberculosis, and a very small number of these patients are actually drug resistant. The only known treatment for at the moment is to lock them away for six months at least with no guarantee that the treatment will work. Does that sound familiar? Well, it's exactly what you described in, uh, in Tanzania of 1908, 1909. Um, and it, it is something that's become very serious because people abscond. And when they abscond, they go back to their home community carrying a disease which spreads easily and is effectively untreatable. And uh, the Cape Town newspapers on occasion come up with this is a major issue that concerns many people, and very few people understand the context and the problems with it. So it's something that's very real to me. If I could, hopefully not use too much time, but move towards Julie's paper, because it was not historical. It was, in fact, current. And in many ways, in many ways, uh, Mari, Mari gives me a, a strong feeling that we can look historically and see what we did wrong and then try and fix it in the future. When I look at Julie's paper, I get frightened because it's ongoing right now. Um, and essentially, the two, two issues that I picked up were the invisibility of cancer, um, caused, and I, this is my word, by the juggernaut of Western biomedicine. I like that. That's a UCT phrase. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's part of this idea of a first world disease which shouldn't be there, but in fact is. I thought it was a very critical point. And secondly was the other issue, which is the competition for resources. And that is very real. That's something I see on a daily basis at UCT Medical School. Um, interestingly enough, this anomaly of South Africa, although you mentioned you suggest the in the inadequate treatment during the years of apartheid, the strange thing was that during the years of apartheid, the full treatment was available for all people, but the scaling was wrong. Basically what it was is it was, you had to be urban, and it didn't matter if you were black or white, but you had to be urban and you had to be accessible to the hospital. What that boiled down to was the fact that the majority of whites could access cancer treatment, the vast majority of blacks could not. And I went, a colleague of mine that I worked with was in fact a radiation oncologist at a state hospital in Lundfontein during the years of apartheid, and I dropped him a note when I read your paper. And I'm just going to read you very quickly what he said in his letter back to me. He says, in my opinion, African patients in our unit of Lundfontein were treated medically as well as any other patients with the same options and dedication. However, the workload for each consultant was nearly ten times greater than Hrutuskira Hospital, which was in Cape Town. Uh, what was available was available to all. However, the circumstances for patients who came from afar, the Sutu and elsewhere in South Africa, was a problem because of the need to be a long way from home for protracted periods, and this was an issue regardless of race. A lot of time, effort, and cost was put into doctors and facilities going out to regions so that patients traveling for treatment or follow-up could be reduced to a minimum. Social work care was there, but was not adequate for the volume of black African patients, and often language difficulties could render ideal cycles, psychosocial care problematic. So it's an issue of resources and an issue of culture clash within that as well, which was interesting. Um, today, and 
I'll try and tie it up quickly. Today, the, the real issues that we're seeing um, is not that diseases like cancer are ranked lower in terms of, of diagnosis. In fact, if anything, they've come up. Uh, Lynn Denny from my department, who I'm pleased to tell, that's publicly or just been promoted to head of obstetrics and gynecology, University of Cape Town, has a major outreach program on cervical cancer in women. Um, so there's an attempt there. The real problem is still an issue of if you're far away from an urban center, you're in trouble. And it, in some cases, it could be as difficult as rural Tanzania or rural Botswana. But also, there's a national approach to shifting the budgets. And that has had an impact on us. Over the last 15 years, the tertiary hospitals, the, one who deal, the ones who deal with, with cancer patients, their budgets have been slashed uh, and the number of beds have fallen because money is being moved into primary care. And that links to the kind of issues you're talking about. Uh, at the moment, there's a panic in the medical schools because we can't train the doctors adequately because we don't have enough beds for patients. Uh, and yet, at the same time, the medical schools, every medical school in the country has been told to increase their output by 50 students a year. Uh, and they're giving us no further, uh, no further funding. So in other words, we have to somehow or other increase our, uh, our 200 student intake in the first year to 250 students. And this is because we're going, to be, we're going to be putting out a new national health system. So this is a very real problem for us. In a sense, just to, to cap up the end, Dr. Weibel's paper actually made me feel very good because I thought, well, if we understand the past, we can learn from mistakes and try not to make them again in the future. Uh, but I must feel that Dr. Livingston's page, uh, paper frightened the daylights out of me because it's something that I can see happening and I don't know how to fix it. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you, John, for uh, inviting me. I so enjoy those manuscripts, Mary, as well as uh, Julie. Uh, definitely wonderful. Temporary or. Do you want to move around here so we can check the back? Yeah. Okay. I can take this down or leave it up, whichever you want. That's fine. Yeah, there's a larger audience. <laughs> <laughs> All those people way in the back. <laughs> Very good. So uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the post manuscripts. Uh, definitely great contemporary as well as our you know, most essential all in terms of uh, uh, sickness history from uh, Just briefly, let me give you a little bit of background, just relevant background from what I reviewed. I myself was born and raised. I'm a native of Ethiopia, a naturalized citizen of the United States. Moved here about 18 years ago from Ethiopia. As a veterinarian, as John introduces nicely, I'm a veterinarian by profession. I practiced in Ethiopia for about five years, early 90s. Um, and uh, before I moved, uh, really the major challenges I've been tackling in uh, mainly big pastoral or nomadic area of southern Ethiopia is trypanosomiasis. Just sleeping sickness in terms of humans, but lots of varieties of trypanosomiasis. In fact, one of the main reasons I came to the US was with one goal of discovering vaccines against trypanosomiasis. It's a major, major challenge. It sounds very much history. When you read it, you think like it has already gone. It's a reality. We neglect it. So what we neglected, it doesn't mean that it's not there. Not only trypanosomiasis, but all the other neglected tropical diseases are still and some of them are really going up, in fact, with all the other cofactors and multifactorial things that were reviewed uh, in those manuscripts. So I ended up in the US working on foodborne pathogens, antibiotic resistance. Often, these diseases are considered as rich man's problems. But still, you know, when I go to Brazil, even in some places, or Africa, you know, when I mention antibiotic resistance, people still consider them as luxuries, as related as in, in, it's all relative, relative to other highly severe diseases such as it was also reviewed here. But in June, a number of them have been reviewed there. So um, uh, just let me pass on to my, uh, my comments. You know, in general, both manuscripts were great, but let me start with, uh, with Mary's and give it a little bit of context. Really, the manuscript definitely outlines 
right now, only just in terms of public health system in the early 20th century, but how much public health system or lack thereof or what you do to control a single disease can have a major impact socially, economically, politically, in governance and other things. You know, the medical auxiliaries, the grand uh, fears, or whatever you call it in, in Germany, uh, you know, in 25 of them in this quarter, they could have a major impact in terms of the society in a positive way, you know, detecting this disease. Uh, really is interesting, you know, how, how much we went since, since the last, in the last uh, 10 decades, how in a positive way, but also in a negative way, when you do things, you know, the, the most take home message I learned from them is that unless you build the trust, you know, you're trying to solve a problem. It's a disease, a problem. Usually, you know, the population would be very happy uh, when someone comes from Germany to solve the problem, but the way it was handled at the time was uh, very uh, much in a mistrustful way. They didn't, they tried to kind of buy their way into the population, paying incentives uh, to uh, really be able to detect and then quarantine by force, uh, give them medicine by force, and solve the problem. And at the end of the day, it was a failure. And really, it's a, it's a lesson to all of us. It doesn't matter whether it's in a public system or any leadership. You need to have the buy-in in a reasonable way. Not you cannot just buy your way through monetary incentives. So that was really a very uh, good thing uh, in terms of the lesson learned in that history. Getting into specific comments, again, as I said, trypanosomias remains a major challenge in the region. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps I'm glad Alan uh, commented before me, usually you know, minus South Africa. You know, South Africa has, uh, it's, it's regionally Sub-Saharan Africa, but you know, when you compare skill demand power, infrastructure, a uh, number of things. It's a night and day difference. I know Cape Town is in a beautiful European type of place with lots of capacities. And the University of Cape Town, the hospital is where the first, I think, uh, health transfer. It's a wonderful scientist as well. At the same time, it's got lots of challenges. You know, dealing with a number of issues. XDR, too, of course, a major issue. In fact, right now, recently, all are. There is a new strain that emerged in India. All are <coughs> resistant to anything. It's a really scary. Uh, or, you know, rabies is a big, big issue. It's increasing in South Africa. In KwaZulu Natal. People are dying from this classical old zoonotic diseases, diseases from animal illness like rabies. Uh, definitely, it's uh, scary to, you know, to get into, of course, a little bit to Julius. But, but when you look at the Sub Saharan Africa, whether it is uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, and others, you face some similar situations. So even if I did not practice in Tanzania, uh, we still do a collaborative capacity building project. Myself, Mike, and a number of us from Ohio State and other universities. But in historically, these problems and the issues of the concerns remain the same. Perhaps a little variation in, uh, in South Africa. Now, trypanosomiasis, besides the human version of it, the livestock versions, Trypanosoma cruzi, Evansi, so many cases I work with in Borana are major, major issues for the day-to-day -day livelihood of the people. You don't need to be directly infected or you know, get Glossina as a vector uh, to bite you to be affected. When your livestock is devastated, it is a major, major concern in that part of the world. Why? Almost anything we do in the day-to-day -day lives depends on livestock. Starting from your consumption. If you do farming, there is no, uh, you know, John Deere or other you know, kind of machines you use in your cattle. You need a biogas, you use cattle. You need fertilizer, you use cattle. You need to, you know, or other animals. You need to guard your property. There is no ADT security. You need to have a big dog you know, watching your property. Uh, in the pastoral regions, whether it is in Kenya, Maasai, or Tanzania, also Maasai, or Boran of Ethiopia, or Fulan of Sudan or Chad, your status in the society depends on uh, the number of cattle you have. It's a, it's a major thing for you. It doesn't depend on how much dollars works and get 100 million, your status is up here. It's a very different society there. 
However, many heads of cattle, many of them in Borana, they don't know how many heads of cattle they have, but their status depends on that. So they are highly, highly uh, essential. Livestock is highly essential for the day-to-day -day lives of people. So when you have problems like trichomosomiasis, it is uh, extremely devastating. In fact, I have to tell you this, and I told this story in different places. Um, when I was practicing in Borana, the Borana people, when they meet each other, they talk about their, it's not about how many children, you know, what great is it, they talk about their cattle. How are their cattle? And, and, and the physicians in the area, my colleague from the same district, usually, when they want to do polio vaccination, nobody shows up. <laughs> When we plan for black leg, rinder pest, mm -hmm. other vaccination, lots of people come with their cattle and with their children. So usually they schedule with us. They call me and they say, when is your schedule to do some vaccination? So it's highly important. Thing. So in the type of remains, I don't want to do it too much on this, but that remains a big, big issue. Um, in terms of, um, you know, detection systems and uh, curing these drugs, you know, definitely uh, <coughs> reviewed 100 years ago with a sleeping sickness. Uh, there was no good drugs and atoxin or other chemicals and lots of side effects and so on. Where are we today? Do we know that? In between, in fact, maybe 50 years ago, we were in a better shape when we thought you know, antibiotics or silver bullets for bacterial infections, but lots of antiprotozoa and anti-helminthic drugs were given. But right now, there's lots of drug resistance. Really, when I read that in, you know, in terms of trypanosomiasis in what's practiced right now, there are lots of drug resistance, whether it is for bacterial disease like XDR or whether it is for protozoan diseases. So it's kind of a scary. We're kind of uh, a little bit back to the old times in terms of uh, tackling those issues. Uh, really, the methods of diagnosis was very interesting to me. Um, Historically, definitely, your review is wonderful. Uh, you really outlined it very nicely how the young figures did and what they did uh, in the society. When you have a lymphadenopathy, physicians like Alison can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but when you have lymphadenopathy, you can have many other diseases. Just, mm -hmm. It's not just yeah. right from the yeah. It's interesting yeah. how they were trying to detect by using lymphadenopathy alone, and you are into a camp labeled as positive for sleeping sickness. And being given a drug that has uh, big uh, side effects, major side effects, that is a little bit sad. And, and really, when you want to detect trypanosomia, it's just a wet film of blood. You can't easily detect it. In fact, if the person or the animal is heavily invest infested, you almost can't see the blood shaking because you have got this blood fragile line. So if you put it in light microscope, you can't detect right away. But at that time, just giving the perspective in a few decades, how much science changed in that regard in terms of uh, diagnosing. But in a day-to-day -day practice, you know, I will read the crisscross between Judy and Mary something. In a day-to-day -day practice, a diagnosis of diseases still are done like the old ways in many senses. <coughs> not only in Africa. I mean, there has been hundreds, maybe not thousands of documentation of of Saharan Africa, most likely if you go to the doctor and you are febrile, you'll be labeled as malaria. Still, right now, if it is malaria in any country, it's malaria. Do you have vomiting, subdiarrhea, or it's typhoid? Okay. So when I come to the Western world, I told you, get a highly sophisticated machine, everything specifically diagnosed. But when I go to my family physician, I'm sneezing and other things. I got at least a couple of times, and the Cipro flux has it. Take it and take six Cipro. <laughs> we still do it here. So it's not only Africa or other developing countries. Lots of, you know, we have lots of tools, we have lots of means, but still uh, there is some similarities in terms of practice. But that was a very interesting thing for me uh, to, to appreciate. I know we take too much time. Uh, Give me the floor sometimes I, I get carried away about this issue, but uh, you can stop me, John, if I'm talking too much. Um, passing into Julie's paper, maybe focusing on that, it's definitely contemporary history. Uh, really, currently, what is uh, going on is definitely, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, capacity building, the lack of skilled manpower, the lack of infrastructure, lack of skilled manpower. There's a couple of instances uh, that Julie showed us 
in her chapter where, uh, you know, just 10 years ago or still, you may have a country where there is only one oncologist per 10 million population. Uh, that's a very common practice. And certainly myself and John, uh, and Mike, were, uh, as well as many of us were in Ethiopia. And the uh, largest hospital, the, the uh, tertiary medical center, which is also a teaching hospital in the nation, had just you know, one, uh, one functioning radiotherapy machine and a couple of oncologists. Okay, And in many cases, even if you have the oncologist, you may not have a working machine. And uh, so lots of things outlined. There are very common instances. In fact, the oncologist, what he told us is, in many cases, people come, let's say, with cervical cancer at advanced stage. And the wait, the queue to be, you know, uh, to get radiotherapy takes six, seven, eight months. He says that it's like a death penalty. Every day, he says, uh, whenever he sees patients, he really feels sad that it's like getting a death penalty. Come back after seven months, he said, most likely that person will not come back. They will be dead by then. So uh, that is really a current reality. <clears throat> As compared to, again, coming back to the Western world, that, uh, when I had visitors from Africa, from different countries, but last year, in fact, you know, showing them or veterinary college, how it's practiced, and we're working to the equine unit, even some of you may not know, but our surgical theaters, the CT scan, and they couldn't believe it. And the uh, president of one of the universities gave us its uh, amazing comment how, you know, life, the discrepancy of life between the Western world and Africa. It's uh, Sub-Saharan Africa particularly, but also Latin America and some part of Asia, uh, definitely. so. The lack of infrastructure, the lack of capacity building here remains uh, a big issue. How we do it is another another key thing in both papers. It really is outlined to some extent, including with Mary's, but as I said, in terms of building trust. Are we doing it in a mutually beneficial way with equal partnership, or are we doing it, okay, I write a grant at NIH, I get this, I go to Africa, you have to do it this way. That system is not sustainable, it's not mutually beneficial, it's not appreciated. I have to tell you that. Um, again, just a few months ago in Arusha, when we had a workshop, there were nice comments given during that workshop, and again, my team was there. You know, don't be somebody's field site, that attitude, which I totally agree. You know, if you have to do it, listen, let's listen to each other. What is your priority? What is my priority? How can we partner? You know, uh, scientists in Africa are very much capable. As capable as all of us, here. but just provide it. It gives them the instrument. It gives them the the, uh, the tools and the resources. Everybody's capable. Uh, but you know, I really appreciate that comment in that there will be somebody's field. That there are many universities from the U.S. and going there, and I want to do this. Tobacco and lung cancer, period. Not that uh, So. Uh, whenever we do this capacity building, it needs to be in a mutually understandable way uh, building our trust that remains the same. Again, poverty is rampant, it's clear. Economically, most countries are very poor. Those are doing relatively better, uh, not as compared to like Botswana, <coughs> is a relatively much better country, but still you know, there are a number of uh, issues addressed. And the number of infectious diseases, as well as cancer, as really Julie and Luther, are related to poverty. In fact, a few years ago, I don't know if how many of you remember or know, at the AIDS World Health Conference, uh, the South African president, Paolo Jackie, says that HIV does not cause AIDS. Poverty causes AIDS. I think what he meant, just the statement as is, I don't accept it, but what he meant is, if you have HIV, and if you are rich, you can be survived. We all know it. Magic Johnson is a good example. You know, since Magic Johnson realized his HIV carrier, I'm sure how many Africans were born since then, grew to adolescence, got infected by HIV, and died by now. So uh, definitely, poverty plays a key role. In epidemiology, as you call it, effect modifier, confounder, whatever we call it, it plays, uh, it plays a major role. So that's a part of the disease, so I think. Uh, what we noted in terms of the role of uh, poverty in this interrelationship of cancer and infectious diseases is extremely crucial. 
uh, as well as you know, this is just a day-to-day -day life of most parts of uh, the world. Uh, so I think in summary, those were wonderful manuscripts. I really enjoyed uh, uh, both of them. And you know, teach us a big lesson in terms of building trust as well as you know, the issues we deal with are you know, much more complicated than, than the way we kind of see it in the textbook. The real life situation is much more Um, my name is Michael Bassessi, and um, I'm an environmental health scientist, and so I've been practicing for a long time. I'm certified in both areas, the occupational aspects of it and the broader aspects of it. And um, I appreciate John's comment. I'm uh, really an expert in environmental health science. I'll accept that. I'm not an expert uh, yet in uh, diseases in Africa. That's an emerging uh, uh, work in progress in uh, working. But uh, first of all, some comments relative to both papers. I mean, there's uh, certainly nothing critical to say about either one. Both very good. Uh, and um, so the approach I'm taking relative to my comments is looking at both of those papers and the topics and the themes and applying the environmental health paradigm, or just some components of it, it would be a couple of years to spend all the time to do it, um, uh, to this. So um, my current involvement uh, relative to Africa has been with Wandesin relative to a NIH Fogarty grant focusing primarily on food safety and security in several East African countries, and um, also uh, facilitating the expanded integration of environmental health science as part of this overarching goal of a One Health approach to address uh, disease uh, prevention, but also identification and so forth um, in, um, in Africa, specifically focusing on Ethiopia, hopefully with success there, building models that would be applicable elsewhere. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the One Health approach, it's really an integration of allopathic medicine or medicine clinical practice in general, we'll call it human, human uh, medicine uh, and all the other areas of that, veterinary medicine, so that interface between human and animal, bi-directional interface, and that environment. And so I, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes, uh, what is environmental health science? So environmental health science is very applicable to this One Health com concept because it is a specialization of environmental science. So pure environmental science will focus on the contaminants and the fate in various matrices, air, water, soil, so forth. The environmental health scientist goes a step beyond that to identify the pathways for exposure and then the relationship of those pathways uh, to human illness. And there's the application of identifying, evaluating, and mitigating various environmental threats uh, to human health. So uh, conceptually, is this a, uh, yes it is. So conceptually, environmental health science focuses here on <coughs> characterizing the factors related to external exposure. How are people exposed? What are they exposed to? How much are they exposed to? And so forth. And so within both papers, we had that. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. And then the interaction with, with the, from the clinical side is looking at biomarkers or effects and so forth. So the manifestation of disease or markers of exposure or markers of uh, the emergence of disease and uh, trying to prevent ultimate uh, impacts in those various categories. The One Health approach is you can add to this diagram animals at each step. 
and apply the same principles, and that's one of the areas we're working on. So the, the application, identification of the issue, it includes anticipation, right? And sometimes anticipation uh, is synonymous with expectations. I heard the comment of cancers were going undiagnosed. Well, if you don't anticipate that cancer is even an issue, one of the paradigms that we get locked into when you look at the less developed countries is that infectious disease is the primary uh, area. And it may remain true primary, but not exclusive. And this is what's changing. And so gathering the data to let the data give you the answer, that's part of the environmental health science par paradigm, both collecting environmental samples as well as epidemiological data for human exposure and risk assessments. And then trying to scale up mechanisms for uh, mitigating the problem. The other concept is, so how are these individuals being exposed, whether it's to a pathogen or a chemical agent or even a physical agent? And so looking at the matrices of exposure, but also the, the pathways, inhalation, ingestion, among other ways of being. So applying this environmental health science approach to the content of these papers, first looking at uh, Julie's paper, if you were to categorize it, which that's much of what we do, either proactively uh, in, their, in terms of the anticipation, based on what we see, but also overlapping with evaluation to identify the cause. So within that paper, expectation was infectious disease, cholera was what was being identified, but along with it, cancer now, and this increasing emergence of diagnosis of cancer. And are, is there, are there factors that are contributing to code diseases? And so the evaluation piece, certainly monitoring for not only the pathogens, but also the vectors that carry them, and also relative to more of the chronic disease, surveillance of toxicants, and the mitigation, and in this case, alluded to the aspects of sanitation, treating water, uh, and so forth, but also there are aspects within that dealing with the occupational health, mining, and how mining has ex uh, expanded the scope of exposures that one needs to anticipate and evaluate and also uh, control. And um, relative to is it Mari or Mary? Mary. Mary. So relative to, yeah, so relative to Mary's paper too, uh, again, you can see the same model here, uh, the evaluation of the vectors and the pathogens uh, and try to eradicate uh, the fly itself or separation, whether it's a form of personal protection in the form of netting to protect exposure to the fly or administrative control in this environmental health paradigm of separating distance from uh, areas that are uh, contaminated. And so if you were to go a step further, and I noticed in, in my papers, one of my slides uh, uh, was, is missing, so I'll just uh, mention it here, is that these are the categories of agents that environmental health scientists uh, pay attention to and have the tools to measure and evaluate and so forth. And so relative to the infectious disease focus, certainly the biological agent, both the pathogen but as well as the vector. And in both cases we were dealing with uh, um, uh, uh, transmission uh, by some form of a vector um, and certainly the organisms involved. Um, but relative to the cancer, uh, is it from a virus? Is it co-disease from uh, a compromised immune system from the infectious disease, increasing the vulnerability when exposed to a carcinogen, a carcinogenic or cancer-causing agent? And the answer is maybe, but without the data, you don't know with certainty. So what's happening there, what was expressed in Julie's paper relative to the chemical, is smoking. So certainly tobacco emissions, I don't limit uh, the toxicants of just tobacco smoke, but the gaseous and the particulate emissions from, from smoke. The increased mining, and mining digging deeper into the earth, you can come in contact with uranium. 
So you have uranium, and the decay product from uranium is radium. Both inhalable, both ingestible. And the decay product from radium is radon, very inhalable. And those are known to be carcinogenic as well. And so um, you have this, these categories we use, chemical, biological, and physical, and at least in Julie's paper, it covers all three. And so the question of why are you seeing you, uh, more cancers, is it because it's been underdiagnosed historically? I think not. I think part of it is, that's part of it, but the other part of it is that there is increased exposure now to substances that can initiate uh, cancers, if not, uh, at the very least, help promote uh, uh, the progression of, of cancer. And then, you know, who's to blame? What are the sources? And so, even in this country, we have examples of this. Pre-industrialization, primarily the natural sources and infectious disease dominated. And as humans got more involved, and humans generated more waste and so forth, they magnified it. So you have this crossover from natural to anthropogenic sources that contribute. And so, coming back to the papers, there's two certainties that uh, I concluded from both. It's more has been done relative to studying pathogenic organisms and the associated infectious diseases, relative to studying toxic chemicals in African countries and the various associated chronic diseases uh, that are now being diagnosed more. And so you're seeing this in other countries as well, where there's been an escalation of chronic disease. So again, even here, pre-industrial revolution, the primary focus was infectious disease. But as part of the industrial revolution and post-industrialization, changing the paradigm of what people do and concurrently what they're exposed to, the same thing's happening right now in these countries that are undergoing development. And so, with emerging and expanding economic development and industrialization, and two examples here, mining, manufacturing, it contributes to this complexity of what do you look for from the clinical perspective? And you can no longer limit it to just the infectious disease aspects. You need to anticipate and evaluate and introduce measures to mitigate uh, the expansion of chronic diseases <coughs> such as cancer, among others. And as a result, clearly a need uh, to incorporate more of the environmental health science. I could go through two wonderfully written manuscripts and easily pull out aspects of environmental health science. And so much of the emphasis goes automatically to the clinical side when oftentimes that's after the fact. And the goal here, especially within the context of the One Health, is to be more proactive and to prevent the exposures, to prevent the diseases, or at least uh, lessen the magnitude uh, of these uh, impacts. And so I'll also conclude that there's more to be gained by working within this One Health, this integrated One Health approach uh, to address these issues that, that remain here. Can I just make one point yes. of clarification? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to say that uh, I may have um, not been clear in the paper that you read, but industrialization, mining, manufacturing are not emerging in Africa. There's been mining in South Africa for well over a century. It's the gestational period of the cancers is long, and it was being systematically ignored, the cancers that were being produced by a, a racial political establishment that was interested in making sure that they couldn't be perceived and counted. So there may be, there are certainly emerging problems going on, but I, I think that we have some very long, I would hate to, to portray Africa as not having a um, 
long-standing experience with industrialization, particularly um, the southern African region or, or various uh, other regions of it. I think that that would be a, a misplacement of the um, good things you're doing by pointing out where environmental health science has a role to play. The question is, why was environmental health science being purposefully excluded and doctored? And that gets us right to politics, economic, you know, yeah, these other kinds of questions. Too. Right, absolutely. So sorry, I just wanted to, yeah, no, to clarify no, no, that. I, and I, just, I would be interested. Do you want to just have questions now? Or do you want to speak to them? I would be happy to open the floor for questions okay, and sure. to discuss yeah, with everyone to respond. But, um, but actually, the first is to say thank you very, very much. Yes. For, this is, it's been really interesting so far, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, I'd like to just kind of throw this out because I was, I was thinking back to Bruce's um, Black Death talk and the aftermath of Black Death, of Black Death which you get to, was the rise of quarantines, and which is essentially the beginning of public health. Um, and but then prior to that, um, power and health is the problem. Power and health, the state and health, authority and health. You guys are authorities. You guys are part of the system. You're trying to make the system work, but there is a system. I think that was the thrust of what you're saying. And, and in fact, in the colonial context, the system is much rawer. Um, in, in, Tanz in, in Tanzania, in East Africa, ger a, German, <laughs> a German colonial authority is coming in and imposing itself and trying to get some legitimacy. The question then, I guess, is really, what is the relationship between the health science, the, the the production of health and the legitimacy of the state. And, and in fact, you were just suggesting this, Dr. Lee, that, that in Southern Africa, the white regimes didn't need legitimacy. They didn't give a damn, really. Uh, but let, you know, or, or they papered it over in certain ways. And this cuts to a, kind of a conversation going on between Al and, and your papers. Um, uh, I just wondered about whether how much you know, we want to get to that red herring, which is sort of uh, not right there. That, that sort of essential problem that's sitting right in the middle of all the papers, which is how does how are resources allocated? Um, you see a huge issue in the United States today. How are resources allocated? How does the state um, manage the expectations of populations um, by distributing health? And you know, one of the one of the barriers and and the uh, you know the barriers to that to that to that goal. Seems like those are those are major major questions. I think we can add another layer of it, perhaps even, which is what are the internal contradictions within the state? Because, I mean, you look at the South African state in the medical establishment, and you look at it through the height of apartheid, and there are people who are visionaries around social medicine, like Sidney Park, who have this really expansive view of what might be possible that's meant to be ameliorative of, um, you know, a really stark system of institutionalized racism. And at the same time, you also have, uh, you know, a, um, you also have ways in which medicine is being instrumentalized in the interest of the state or of capital, and surveillance is taking place, and quarantining is being used as a rationale for segregating space in various ways and all the rest of it. But to just say that, thus, it, it helps us. One of the things that it helps us do as historians is break open the state and look at all the different tensions and, and contradictions within it. I mean, even if you look at Ronald Reagan's AIDS policy, once you look inside of it, like um, Jenny Breyer, the historian at University of Illinois Chicago has done, you find that there are all these progressive things going on amid a state um, that has an explicit message that would seem to be antagonistic to it. So it helps us kind of look at all those different pieces at the same time. And if we can join, that's, so that's one piece. And then the second piece is what uh, Mari's bringing up in relationship to who the community is. Because if you're the patient, it means something else entirely. So, I mean, I'm sure that your colleague at Blueprint Chain is, is wonderful. And it, he sounds like somebody who was working very, very hard for people who are very sick. But nonetheless, when that patient is there, they feel power. And their freedom to express what's going on with them, how they perform as a patient, the way that they feel 
uh, privileged to ask a question or not, how they interpret what's happening to their body may have something to do with, with the culture clash, as you say, but I'm sure even more so has to do with real questions around authority, power, the hospital is a state institution, et cetera, et cetera. Just like I live in New York City, and if you are an undocumented uh, worker in the city, <laughs> the way that you enter Bellevue Hospital is going to be different than if you go in there uh, as an American, uh, white, middle class woman with your Blue Cross Blue Shield card. It, they're, they're different. So we can use the, all those tensions um, in these multi-perspectival ways that I think the gland feelers um, work starts to open up for us, maybe. And if I could just say something about um, the, because I can I can hear the kind of question or the, the comment about the German colonial state in particular, um, which is which is a point duly noted. But in the Great Lakes region, in this particular period of time, it's a state that's very very thin on the ground. Yeah. I think we have to remember constantly, particularly in this early colonial period, but throughout that that there is a pretense to power and to and to control and to total surveillance, um, particularly when you're talking about public health. But that it is that, and I would argue that that, that rarely is it complete. And in this sort of situation, you're not only talking about, about colonial public health power coming in and being interested in particular ways, but you're also talking about African authority and African political power that exists right alongside it and in negotiation with it. And those two things are, are engaging in really interesting and productive ways. But also that, um, I mean, there, there's been very good writing recently, Deb Neal and, um, and Mary Nez Lyons and older work on sleeping sickness also mentioned this that um, sleeping sickness is one of the first times that colonial states start to think about the health of large populations of African subjects um, because it becomes a threat to, colonial, to, the, to the survival of colonial economies and it's about plantation labor and it's about caravan quarters where people can live. And so, and so the, the, the nature of what exactly colonial health or colonial public health is, is really starting to shift in this time period. And it's also, I think, important to think of how that those movements in public health, even though it is this multi-layered thing, start to make populations more legible. They're, they're better known. One of the things that doesn't come across as strongly in this paper, but that's really a significant impact, these, these German doctors are going into these areas, as many colonial doctors do, without a knowledge of, of local languages and without a, a good sense of where the population is distributed or how to get from one place to another. And seven years later, by the time the campaign winds down and the war is upon them, they have tax rolls. For, and they know where everybody is. Maybe not everybody, but they have a pretty good idea. And so it changes the nature of people's relationship to the state in really, really crucial ways, too, I think. So. Just one comment. If they're successful, then they, their rule is somewhat legitimate. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, just because, just because you go, I mean, like if the if the if the sleeping sickness camp at Kigarama had been successful, if they'd been able to cure sleeping sickness, would it have somehow made the German state better or more or more positive well, in the eyes of the people that were? Um, I mean, I mean that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I don't know. You can I think about I think about the way that you engage with with a variety of doctors and medical professionals. You know, just because you go and you get antibiotics doesn't mean you're going to stop taking airborne, which we know no doesn't work, right? Or you're going to to sort of do your same. I mean, it's not to say that, that there's legitimacy in it. I, I don't. That's not a very good analogy, actually. And I have to think about it a little bit more. But, but I. I mean, I think you have buy-in for a number of reasons. You know, people are getting cured, but they're also getting other things that they need. You know, if the state ceases to provide those other things that they need, will people withdraw? Perhaps. Will they try to go someplace else? Perhaps. Um, well, sorry. Well, sorry, Tony, we'll go back here. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in the tension in both these papers between between visibility and invisibility, and then I think also legibility, because in in, in both cases we see uh, there there are phenomena that are out there that have not they're trying to sense that they're, they're that the, that the, the you know the um, entity whether the state or the colonial state or the healers are trying to sense. So what, what is it, though, that produces invisibility? Is invisibility something that, that comes directly? Is it, is it a product or is it a byproduct? I mean, what's, what's, how do we see if cancer is invisible, what, what, is, what, is the, what, what drives to make it? What drives to make it invisible? And, and obviously it's not intentional, but how, how can we look at this process? Because in a way, I feel like in, in your paper, 
the, the bad guy really is invisibility. I mean, the, this, this, but how if we want to then turn to face that? How how do we do that? And how do we how do we do that analytically as well to to deconstruct invisibility? Um, and then I think in, in Mars' paper, this this the connection with with the legibility of the state and and the the way the power flows through through health interventions through known resources, and I think uh, they both, but your particular your paper in particular for the health practitioners raises questions about who are our intermediaries, who are the people in place. I mean, the, the practice of global health has been field sites and making places field sites, um, and so how how do, how does that power work, and how does that how does that change the data that comes out of these things, which are, which social scientists are very interested in. But uh, you know, collaborations between medical people and social scientists often, you know, look at that in very different ways. And so, I think it raises interesting questions for all practitioners on that one. Um, if I could just speak to the second, the second piece of it in terms of thinking about who your intermediaries are. There's um, an epidemiologist, uh, but who was also trained as an anthropologist um, in Atlanta. He's working with the Carter Center for River Blindness Programs. His name is Moses Katabarwa, and he's uh, Ugandan and has been leading and helping with river blindness elimination in Uganda. And he's got these wonderful articles that are published in public health journals, but they're very anthropologically minded about community development. And I've had him come and talk to my classes a couple of times, and we talked about it too. And he says, you know, you can you can go in and say we want one good public health worker, we want one good person who's going to monitor this entire community, we're going to give them the supply of mechanism, they're going to take care of giving it out, and it'll be great. He says, but then you think about, you know, you've got a family that's across town, and maybe this person that you've given all this power to has sort of bothered someone's daughter at some point, and they're not going to go over and take drugs from that guy. That's not going to happen. He said, and so we went in and said, okay, instead of just having one guy, what if we say, send us everybody you want. Send us as many people as you want. We'll train them. We'll see who ends up being the person who does that work in the end. But then you, you, you start to avoid and to work around those problems of who exactly that person is. Or you, you incorporate so many people that who that person is. Is, is, is manageable for everybody in the place. And it's been very interesting to hear him talk about how that's working now and is really different than, I think, the model of community participation, which is, you know, which is an elite person or somebody somebody who's educated in a particular way that then can be the, the intermediate media officer. And there are ways of breaking that up, I think, that are promising and interesting. Um, to the question of visibility and access, Visibility. One of the things that I find interesting is how things get forgotten. So, you know, tuberculosis was a huge problem in southern Africa, and then it sounded invisible for a while, even though you could see it everywhere. Nobody cared, nobody counted, nobody whatever. And then because it got hooked on to HIV, all of a sudden it's the big thing to look at again. And then with MDRTB and XDRTB, you know, it's there's a bright light being shined upon it. And there, there, there. I'm sure it will get forgotten again and remembered again. Is I, I would assume. Well, I'm not sure. But that's what I would expect. And with cancer in Africa, you can see it very clearly, right? Right there in in European and American cancer journals. Articles being published. Cancers named after scientists discovering particular cancers in Central Africa partnerships between American or British and African oncologists. When I read the missionary medical literature, there are <coughs> cancer cases all over the place. And because I have friends who knew I was working on cancer, they would send them to me. So I have them from missionary medical stuff in Nigeria, even though that's not where I work. And when you go give a talk, people say, well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I'm from Cameroon and my sister had cancer. And you think that, oh, Africans don't get cancer or whatever. It, things are visible, and then they go invisible, and then they become visible, and then they go invisible. And there are all kinds of, um, of material that animate the politics of knowledge and what gains visibility at a particular moment. Right now, it would appear that the National Cancer Institute wants programs, uh, grantees, to be able to demonstrate that they've got some international reach. And all of a sudden, global oncology is going to be fully on the table, and things are going to be highly visible. What's going to become invisible in the wake of that? I don't know, but <laughs> I'm sure something. Or you read Keith Waylu on um, 
cancer in this country, and the cancer among African Americans was invisible for a long time, and then rendered highly visible, and then marginalized to invisible, and then rendered visible again. So there are questions we have to ask ourselves, first of all, about how scientists read, how far back they look, which I find fascinating. As historians, you can see a, a loop of scientists rediscovering their old knowledge that scientists can't recognize because, of course, they look forward and they only read back in a very um, kind of narrower template. And the terms change. So even if they do a little search, they can't see that they're looking back for this thing that we're trained to know how to see. So that's another question around it. There's a question around how technologies as new tools suddenly create explosions of visibility. And then there's a question about which patients are able to put their concerns on the table and how. So, I mean, I think you're pointing to something um, that's really important. But I would, I'm hesitant to call anybody or anything the bad guy. Because I think that that does a disservice to the complex web by which this, I know you didn't mean it like that, but gets created. I would hate to, for um, it to look like it's a conspiracy theory between conspiracy between big tobacco and Anglo-American mines. That's why people have cancer now. Now here comes Merck. I mean, that's, that's true. <laughs> it's really true. But by the same token, there were all kinds of really smart uh, cancer scientists who thought, well, let's see, cancer equals white people. Black people aren't, cancer is a disease of civilization. White people aren't, uh, I mean, black people aren't civilized enough to get cancer. Meanwhile, you have no infrastructure on the ground to aggregate the cancers that they, those same doctors are, or a different group of doctors are seeing. There is no cancer in Africa. Hence, this knowledge is correct. But, I mean, do you, it, it, I think it's important for us as historians to find those closed loops where they exist and try to examine how they get produced and what the effects are. That has effects for white, middle class, American women like myself with cancer. I mean, <laughs> that you have a whole set of knowledge that's being produced based on a false assumption about what it is and where it comes from. I think uh, you are absolutely right. Unless you look for it, it doesn't exist. As if it mm -hmm. doesn't talk about it. It's right. there unless you look for it. But at the same time, I think it is clearly, uh, for some reason, there is increasing, emerging. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Even in a young generation, yes. not besides the long gestational incubation period. Yes. Um, but I think linking it to uh, the cause and effect is, I think, and is a challenge. Right? Yes. I think, no, that's absolutely critical. I don't want to say it's only that now we can see it. And therefore, it looks like it's emerging, but it's not. No, it's clearly emerging really rapidly. But if the answer is, and therefore, we need uh, more chemotherapy, that's one important answer. But if we don't turn off the cigarette tap at the same time that we send chemotherapy, we're wrong. If we don't say it's not OK to dump nuclear waste on the Puntland coast of Somalia, because there's no real state there to watch the coast, and that's a convenient place to send it, I don't care how much, uh, you know, cisplatin you can send there. That's not the way to, to solve that problem. So it all needs to be put together. And if you look at the logics by which environmental health policy was being determined by the World Bank, that this is the place you should dump your toxic waste because they don't get cancer, well, then you have to make it visible that they do get cancer. So you better find another place to put it or maybe produce less of it. I, I mean, you know, there are also uh, politics behind what's causing the emergence. So I'm afraid that sometimes global health goes running for the solution, but there are extreme <coughs> factors that are kind of pumping out the jam at the same time. Yeah, question back here. Uh, you sort of got me upset about the healthcare system for minutes. I, I almost forgot the question, but um, if you are a nurse or a doctor in the ER room, you are just besieged. It's like a tidal wave coming at you, and you don't have time to think. You go with the odds. You see this person coming in. We got to diagnose this, and we got to get him through. Uh, I, 
nursing was a second career to me, and I doubt that anybody has ever worked as hard as a, a nurse on a 12-hour shift in a critical care hospital. You just do what you can to get through the day. So that's why the criticisms by non uh, healthcare workers upset me. Uh, but my question before that was in this country, uh, anytime you hear a politician talking about uh, uh, better education, I think, here's somebody who's never worked with patients. Uh, if you go over to the hospital over here, all the obese people know they shouldn't be obese, they should eat more fruit and vegetables. The druggies know I shouldn't take drugs. People with HIV know, well, I shouldn't have unprotected sex when I was drunk. Uh, the smokers know they shouldn't, but they do it anyway. And they know these, so it's not an educational thing, maybe an addiction thing of some sort. But I wonder if your patients, and so education in, in this country, I, I don't have much hope for. But in your country, would the people over there be more compliant and more apt to listen to uh, a, a medical authority if they did have the information, yeah, you need malaria nets and you need vaccinations and so forth, or are they going to be like Americans and uh, sort of ignore the education? I mean, one of the things that I think is, and, and this is, Julie can speak more to, to how this applies to what's going on, but one of the things that I think is an interesting um, first question to ask back to that is, is this idea of compliance and non-compliance, okay? Because, um, because we, I think, assume that because people don't do what they are supposed to do, that they don't want to, or that they know, and they've just chosen not to. And sometimes I think there are a whole host of factors, and I'm, and I'm speaking with sort of Paul Farmer, um, and his work on, on compliance and non-compliance sort of out, out here, that um, there are a lot of factors that, that influence how and why people can make the choices that would allow them to be healthy, or if people can even make choices that would let them do the right thing to the medical establishment, to become compliant. And so I think that the first thing to say is, is when, we're, when we're labeling people as compliant or non-compliant, are you taking into account the full, the full host of the social circumstances that have led them to that place? Can a person who is obese, who knows, who knows that they need food, better fruits and vegetables, get to a grocery store where those are being sold and afford to buy them, for instance? And that's, that's a, a sort of basic question. But I think when you're talking about education, um, you, you sort of assume, or, or, or it's easy to assume, that, because, that if people only knew better, then they would do better, or do what they were supposed to do. And, and people are, are highly informed, I think, and, and Julie, you can talk about this specifically, about what their choices may be. And how that how that applies, but then they have to make very very difficult choices to to think about care for themselves or for someone else. I mean, um, I first would say that any nurse who works in an emergency room, or basically any nurse who works in a hospital anywhere around this globe, is working hard in my experience, and I do not want to disparage them in any way. That is very very difficult work. So I appreciate you. Uh, bringing that up, one hundred percent. And there is a, we talked about it earlier today in, a, in another meeting. I mean, there are some massive global nursing crisis, huge, huge, huge. And alongside the talk about moving drugs around and all the rest of it, supporting the nurses who work in really, really, really difficult, incredibly challenging conditions in the global south by paying them enough by providing them the kinds of supplies and authority they need in order to be effective, by having enough money to hire enough of them that they can have uh, six patients to a nurse rather than 20 patients to a nurse or 200 patients to a nurse is a, a fundamental need that we don't need any studies, we don't need any evidence-based anything to tell us that that's something that would improve health care tremendously. It's a no-brainer. So I appreciate you uh, bringing up nursing. The second thing I would say is, I, you know, I have mixed feelings about health education. I think on the one hand, there are a lot of people who do benefit from having a baseline of knowledge, and they do make choices based on that knowledge. So the person who might be obese may also have decided not to smoke because they know that what that will produce for them. So. There's health knowledge out there. It's good for people to have that knowledge. 
And then that doesn't mean that they're going to accord with everything that they've heard. I don't think that means we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I think it means that within that knowledge is not enough. So first there needs to be knowledge. And then there needs to be the recognition that we don't know everything either. And we don't understand why and how people are making the choices that they do. And that when they approach healthcare and healthcare establishments, they're doing it oftentimes from a politics of pragmatism, where they, uh, the, I, the rate of medical error in this country is very high. So too in the part of the world where I work. People know that going to the doctor or being admitted to the hospital is a risky endeavor. They may come out feeling far better than they did when they went in, and they may not. They may come out far worse, in fact. Or they may come out having solved one problem and having another produced for them. So when the same authority tells them, don't do this, do that, they're also parsing that information. And their, their world, like our world, is a wash in information. And much of that information is contradictory. So that's another element of it uh, to think about. Who are we when we tell people what they should do or shouldn't do, and how believable are we in that respect? I mean, obesity is a perfect example for that, because the flavor of the month of what people should eat or shouldn't eat, and what it matters, and how much you exercise, and do you walk 30 minutes a day, and that's supposed to do everything, well, it turns out that wasn't true, and blah, blah, blah. It enables a lot of people to turn it off, and if they're being told that, um, in part when they come into a, a hospital where they have a parent who um, was highly disempowered at the end of life and they saw die the kind of death that maybe they feel very um, allergic to how intensivized it was and how disempowered they were vis-a-vis -vis the medical establishment that they were not able to make choices that they had thought long and hard about. Those things are all mixed together and so too in Africa. African patients are sophisticated like American patients. African relatives are sophisticated like American relatives. And they're making uh, choices in a world of constraint, of uncertainty, of um, a constant ebb and flow and change of information. But in particular, African patients do not get to have, by and large, a clinician who is theirs. They are not privileged to form the kinds of relationships of trust that we get to when you have a primary care provider. And that makes it very, very difficult for them to do that kind of parsing that we're talking about. In addition to that, most countries in Africa do not have a universal health system. And therefore, people are paying out of pocket. And therefore, decisions about should we buy these special foods for grandma or pay for this pill for so-and-so, or pay for a special go to boda taxi to take the, the pregnant woman here because it looks like it might be an obstructed labor, or, I mean, the co collection of cobbling together little bits of money by relatives in order to make their health decisions, make them uh, high-stakes decisions in a zero-sum world of resources, and I think that further complicates things. Oh, <clears throat> thanks for two great papers. Um, I've got a question that's a bit more historical, um, but really just about the concept of development, where it came from, um, what we do with it. Um, obviously, both papers uh, are looking at this. Uh, Julie's in particular. I mean, it seems that prior to the the sort of develop the sort of development of development theory, um, the the African had already been constructed as as cancer-free, natural, someone with good teeth and good bowels. Uh, you sort of find this in all the dietary literature in the early 20th century, um, and not prone to the diseases of civilization. Um, so therefore, when we get the sort of developmental model put in place, there seems to be this kind of obstruction already there in the way in which African people have been, and, and non-Western people in general, have been uh, constituted. Um, so it seems that so Africa is modeled as uh, suffering from diseases of backwardness or environment, trop the tropical disease. You're kind of concentrating on, on these here. Um, and what you're showing in your papers is that things are supremely more jumbled on the ground than that. Is that there are elements of diseases of civilization, 
uh, of environmental diseases, of infectious diseases, all kind of thrown in together into the mix. And we've chosen to extract certain ones and occlude certain other ones to produce simplistic dichotomous models of, of development. So the question I have for you is, given that we all need some kind of simplistic model to work with that's general, um, how do we complicate our idea of development to take into account this, this obviously vastly more complicated model on the ground? I mean, if you look at American health today, I mean, Mississippi life expectancy is like 10 years lower than California. Um, uh, the United States is incredibly differentiated. Uh, dengue fever is moving, as we learned last year, northwards every year. So tropical diseases are, are emerging as the climate change. The environment isn't fixed. Nothing's fixed. So how do we begin to rethink our historical models? Tell me now. <laughs> it's such a good question. Horrible question. It's so much easier, it's, you know, it's so much easier to figure out why to throw it out than to figure out what mm -hmm. to replace it with. I mean, I, I don't know what the model should be, but I will say that the barrier between this is environmental health, this is um, the history of medicine, this is science, and this is um, economic history, just it doesn't make any sense if we want to, to understand um, how these uh, kinds of, whatever you want to call them, development right. cycles, I don't know, come from or what they're going to look like, or where they're headed. I mean, it, it's easy to see where they come from and how they're related to Darwinism, how they're related to physical biology, and then Boaz comes in and kind of breaks it up, and new room is established here. I, it, you know, they're really long-standing. They're built into Linnaean uh, classifications and how we understand kinship across different species barriers, things that if you read uh, Stefan Helmrich, it looks like marine biologists are totally throwing out the window and suddenly it's these totally different kinds of webs and networks that look more like a Facebook <coughs> friend thing than, uh, than a taxonomy. I mean, it, and I'm certain there'll be some model of development that will look like that because now we think in networks and everything's going to look very cybernetic and all the rest of it and then that'll get thrown out. I, I, I don't have a I have no model to replace no. the model I want to throw away. Right. Let's just be anarchist. But those models have been <laughs> sort of throughout our, our one and a half years of this, these models of development, of transitions, of, of a series of interwoven mm -hmm. synergistic transitions um, that are geographically differentiated. That's, I mean, I guess it's like super uneven differentiated development is about as good as we've got. Mm -hmm. so. But they're also always based on all these falsehoods. I, I mean, it's often hard, it takes a while to, um, when you talk to epidemiologists, there used to be that theory that the reason that African Americans have high rates of hypertension is that there was something about the Middle Passage that caused uh, um, African Americans who could retain water better to survive the Middle Passage, and so there was this genetic preference, and that's why we have high rates of hypertension. Here and we have no hypertension in Africa. There's tons of hypertension in Africa. What on earth are you talking about? It, it, you, I don't know why I went down that road. <laughs> <laughs> Mary? Oh, no. um, I will think about it. And perhaps it's get back to you. It's just asking you to yeah, sort of re reformulate how we think about development. Where is Odell? We need him. We need a long duration. Right. Oh. But, but, I mean, but, but in essence, you're saying interconnection. In other words, we cannot have uh, divided fields. And we have to think across fields, and we cannot think that economic history and, and uh, medical history and, and everything is, is separated, and, and they have to be co integrated. Into, into and they can't be centers and peripheries. One health. It's one health. There we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good Bob Marley was singing. <laughs> but also, we can't have centers and peripheries. Yeah. It also doesn't work like that. You know, you guys know the Indian Ocean has been connecting Africa to Asia long before the Europeans came upon. 
Well, the Kennedy centers and peripheries did this change. They're not. They're not in the. They're not the Palestinian centers and peripheries. Where there was, well, even even that was even assuming a whole different set of centers and peripheries in the, in the Middle Ages that have been layered over with another one. So I, I mean, I, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay. Yeah. But at, but at the same time, I think I mean I think Julie's point is is and, and we were talking about this last night is a point well taken that if you're you're going to talk about development and look about the impact of development on the environment and then you're going to talk about development and look at, look at at health and development and then you're going to talk about economics that you're losing you're losing the the, the real impact that all of these things are having having on people's lives you know and and no you know somebody who is who is sick and in a cancer ward in Botswana isn't going to say this is about bad economic development policy. It's not going to be about one thing, I think, and that, and I, and I don't know if that's kind of what you're getting at. Is is it about multidisciplinarity, or <laughs> I is it just? Exactly is sure it what just I, I, I think, think Tamara might have the answer. Okay. Oh, I don't have an answer. Up, so I have a I have a question along these lines. Okay. <laughs> and going back to sort of Professor Brooks' original. <laughs> then, then, then proceed. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> going back to your original question about the state. So in my field, we love descriptors of the state. Like everyone's book is titled "The Hidden State," "The Welfare State," "The Administrative State." And when you asked your question about the state, I was like, what, like, is that where the power lies? So, you know, getting to both of your issues, there is a very powerful state. So Botswana versus Zimbabwe comes across very strongly. At the same time, it's NGOs, it's non you know, it's, it's um, non-state actors, it's NIH grants, which go through nonprofit universities, which then get funneled to site specific. They're thinking about the state when we're talking about healthcare, it seems like we really, really need a new set of um, boundaries or words or some way to think about this carefully. And I think the value of thinking about it carefully is it helps us track power. So just saying it's so multifactorial that we can't think about it doesn't seem to be useful. And in both of your papers you seem to be going somewhere with your analogies and I was just wondering how you guys think about it. Have you conceptualized it further? Do you have a descriptor that you affiliate with this that helps you affiliate with the healthcare state or health services state? It seems like it'd be it'd be useful. Or maybe it's not useful, which you can say too. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's useful, yeah. but it's also a question of the state in relationship to what. I mean, when you said Zimbabwe and Botswana, then I thought for a moment about comparing the two, and they're both very powerful states for people on the ground, but in radically different ways. <coughs> In Botswana, patients can go into the hospital, and the hospital can have all kinds of problems, and they can go into their school or their courthouse, and it can have all kinds of problems. But they walk in as a citizen, and they own it, and it's theirs, and they know it. They may complain that the line is too long, they may complain that that nurse was rude, they may complain that this is like this, but it's theirs. They're not begging for it. They don't have to say thank you, though they're very polite, and they do. But, you know, they're saying thank you to a human being, not to some gift coming from some outside place. This is mine. And I'm a citizen of the state that I can also complain about and that I'm worried about is changing in this way. And if I'm of this ethnicity, I might have this particular problem with the state as a linguistic minority. Or as a woman, I may have a problem with the state because of how this and that work. But that's what it is. In Zimbabwe, right now, people are... The state is quite palpable in its absences and in its presence, right? People are well aware of the state. Some people are quite afraid of the state. Some people lower their voice because they're not sure if the state is listening. People don't know, you know, what the state is capable of, what it's up to. On the other hand, they know full well what the state is doing at a given moment, and they know that their state right now is internally contradictory, and eventually the head of state is going to die, and nobody knows what's going to happen. And you can look at Zimbabwe as a failed state, or you can look at the Zimbabwean state as being very, very powerful, because when they say joke, a lot of people have to, right? And, when, and people's politics are fully conscious of who the state is at every given moment. I, th I think in, to some extent we got to, not derailed is the wrong word, but um, the Foucauldian model of power, which is tremendously productive and useful for understanding how things work, can't stand as the only model of power. And, you know, my uh, friend Paul Landau, who also works in Botswana, always says, 
of Botswana, a village in Botswana, is a panopticon, right? You have to sit out on your front porch. It looks like a cross-section of a honeycomb. There are all these little wards. There's members of the aristocracy who live in each ward. And people can see one another. You know what's up. You know you're visiting your neighbors. Everybody kind of knows what's going on in public life. And you never know who's watching, who's visiting, who, who's doing what. Uh, just like in a small town in New England, I'm from New England, it's highly panoptical, as you know, because you're also from New England, right? But, but at the same time, in the center of the village, they publicly flog people, right? It's not either or. <laughs> no, it's not either or, but it seems particularly with health services, you have a different, uh, a specific kind of flow of money. That, that's all I'm saying. It seems like particularly in this one way, um, where money comes from is more is more diverse or has a particular kind of power dynamic and um but, but maybe it's not you maybe this okay. yeah and then a I lot mean, of that yeah. depends on how the particular state brokers these public yeah. private partnerships which are emergent and the Botswana state is very smart where this is concerned because they will not allow parallel structures to exist mm -hmm. if you give money they insist on folding it into the Ministry of Health bureaucracy which gives them ultimate control over what happens you cannot be a freestanding structure out there doing what you want because you brought a lot of money and unfortunately that's what you see in many other places and as a result the state can't pull together and coordinate what's going on so I, I now I understand what you're asking sorry I thought we were just talking about the state and not in relation to the health. oh no I meant sorry mm -hmm. many of the other African countries are moving towards that direction even if you are USAID or others and giving money, unless the uh, Ministry of Health uh, gives a blessing, you said you wouldn't give them. Just had recent experience the last couple of days myself, I'm some of the grants that you need to get the ministry's endorsement before you get grants from uh, you know, funding agencies. It's not like the competitive NIH others, but like USAID or other donors or government bank or others. So they have the full control of the funds and what you do in the country. But there's also a reinscription of the state from the early 90s when people gave up on the state and were happy to fund NGOs and allow parallel structures to, to take place. And I thought in your paper, this the same kind of arc that the 60s and the 70s are a time of cancer research and there's cancer things happening at a time where people believed that these that things could develop, right? Before the before inflation, before the single market, you know, um, single product markets fail this kind of thing. So there's, there's this imagination of the state and the possibility in both of these places that, that has the kind of curiosity that you were talking about before. Absolutely. Oh, I like you. oh yes, we're in the back. Yeah. I just had a quick question. It was also in relation to the state and how well that they manage their health care systems in all these countries. And you just mentioned that now the health ministries are mandating that when you're bringing in international funds, Whereas before, international organizations will mandate how they will determine how the funds will be used. Now you have local governments trying to mandate how they can properly like apportion the money for the health system. But how well are they being accounted for in these countries? Because you still have the problem of not everybody receiving the appropriate health care that they should. And if they are implementing this in place, which I guess which um, body is overseeing this because they can easily defy the AU or the United Nations. It all boils down to the country itself trying to determine how well they can use the money so the government might see it as appropriate, <coughs> but then it's not helping the local people. So, how are they, um, I guess, how are they assessing how useful these funds have been used? Just to, to comment on that, um, I think there is two parts of that. One is, you know, if you look at it ultimately for any country, you know, the responsibility of developing the health system and implementing wise into the country's government. All the others, whether it's energy or academic partners, others, you know, play a role, collaborating and making impact. Uh, but you know, ultimately, the uh, regulatory or other systems is just belongs to the nation. So they know the priorities. They know what they give uh, endorsement to. They may or may not accept what you want to do. 
even if the U.S. or other governments would like to give money now, they shifted that just because it's your money, you can't just give it, dole it out wherever you like. You have to go through, you have to live based on our priorities. That's what they mandate they put, and it's a mutual agreement between uh, governments and, for example, the Ethiopian government and U.S. government, USAID agreed on that. So if you have a wonderful idea and you have great collaboration, you can see with USAID, they don't just give you money. They have to get approval or a blessing saying from that country that, yes, this is a priority to my country, so that you get that funding. But you are quite right that if the state is kleptocratic, yeah. that, exactly. <laughs> yeah. that does not help that problem. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, what I hear you pointing to is that can, depending upon the state, can be used to simply line the pockets of or produce the pet projects of some while the majority still continue to not have their health improved. And those are big, big, big problems. And once, like Chris's question, I certainly uh, don't have the answer to, but I appreciate it being put on the table. I mean, this is a place where Botswana is quite exceptional in that regard, I would say. Certainly compared to uh, in the city of Boston, where I'm from, or New Jersey, where I work now. So, you know, it's not, a, it's not simply an African uh, issue, which is why I mentioned these two other places, but it's certainly incredibly accentuated in many um, African contexts right now. And it's nested in a broader economic system that is incredibly problematic. Right, where you have these little enclave economies and nothing else underneath it. And another thing that's implicit, at least from from what you were asking to me, is is the idea of whether or not the people who are dealing with a particular health issue or a particular disease or are looking for some sort of amelioration are able to communicate effectively with the state if the state is is actually asking them what is important. And I think this is something that gets to what um, what one was saying about when we think about these neglected diseases and, and maybe to a certain extent this question of invisibility, um, you know, you have you have prioritization and, and particular ways of thinking about solutions that are I mean these diseases are not neglected to the people who are suffering from them and watching people die of them or going blind from them. You know, they're not they're not neglected at all. They become that and as soon as they're designated as neglected, they're not as neglected as they were the day before, right? Because now the full force of global health is staring right at it. You know, and, and, and the question may be then is how is that designation determined? It's a very powerful designation. Is it something that comes in at, from a conversation with community? Is it a national health service? Is it a ministry of health? And, and how tuned in is that ministry of health to, to dealing with the public health of the population? Or is it, in a, as, as Julie said, a kleptocratic situation where that's not the interest? <coughs> I mean, these are different things. I'm sorry. There's a question behind you, but I just want to interrupt. I know that Mike Possessi has, has an appointment in the near future. So I want to thank you for coming um, before you leave. <laughs> so for one thing, I'm just going to put my hands together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mari, I'm now realizing that you've sort of been saying this all along, but I think I'm, I'm kind of getting it right now. It, it strikes me that part of this conversation about sort of the current um, state of the state and state of healthcare and state of the sort of confusing NGO state-based um, environment has a really strong parallel to the period that you're talking about and the auxiliaries that you're talking about. Um, and one of the ways, I mean, I'm a sort of bottom-up person in terms of methodology, so trying to think about the model of the state is is difficult, but I think that you know one of the things that you're seeing in your piece is the state becoming legible to these people, right? People who are suddenly seeing what it is that their glands are being felt for, right? And mm -hmm. and similar to you know this the question of the modern day Zimbabwean is like how do you then extract from that experience what the state's intentions are and what this thing is, um, particularly in an environment when you have a lot of exit options, right? When this is not, you know, it's not state-provided healthcare. It's not, you know, this is, there's many, many models going on. So I just, um, I just want to encourage you to, to keep pushing that parallel because I think it's one that people don't often, don't often go to. They look at 
sort of more recent in the 40s or the 50s yeah. or something. Yeah. Not yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks, actually, because it's, it's always nice to have the, the language that you use turned back to you with a couple of things changed around and it clicks into place. So, you know, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about these gland feelers as operating um, as operating as, as a sort of extension. They're, they're imbued with royal Ziba power as well as colonial biomedical power or, or authority. I mean, they're, they're taking with them village elders and maybe sometimes soldiers when they're going out into these villages. You know, I mean, they're, they're coming with different, with different clothing, potentially. They're coming with particular tools that they're using that not everybody has, and, and that marks them. Mm -hmm. And you, you see them as people who are so different, right. but then in the process of them going out into the, into the villages, into a, into a family's you know sort of farm, does the family then start to understand? Oh, okay. So what these people need to know is my name mm -hmm. and how old I am, and you know whether I've been to Uganda in the last year or not, right? And and is it, okay. So then so then my you know where I've been working is important. There was this whole idea that's just fascinating in this period that women that that. And, and this is complicated by the fact that some trypanosomal diseases are sexually transmitted. So, so veterinary trypanosomal diseases are, are can be sexually transmitted. But the the you had scientists who were thoroughly convinced that it was impossible for women to have gotten sleeping sickness in any other way but as a sexually transmitted disease, because women aren't traveling, they're not migrating, they're not moving around, they're not going to the lake and back again. You know, this, and and it's just it's fascinating in the way that the colonial literature sort of constructed this idea about gender and mobility, mm -hmm. buried in these really uh, rigid ideas about how diseases are being transmitted. And you can kind of think about that. I don't know where how exactly I got on that edge of it either. But I mean, it, it sort of it it ties into what exactly people think they're supposed to be. I mean, do they care? Do they care if the gland feelers are really wanting to use this information? If it provides them access to things they might not have been able to access before, perhaps. Right. You know. And there's another piece of my work that's really about why do people come and go from the camp? Because mm -hmm. they come and go. They come and go in part because they they will not be interned and quarantined. But they also come and go because they can get little pieces of land, because they can do a variety of other things. And we so often talk about why people leave or whether they're rejecting biomedicine, rather than thinking about what they're getting <laughs> that comes along with it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So to me, um, both of your papers are about measurement and detection. Um, so I'm an epidemiologist, so really the whole world is about measurement and detection. Um, but you know, in both you're trying to identify the, 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 the actors in your stories are trying to identify the problems, they're trying to find the ill, they're trying to find the infected from, from among the population. But but in both cases what do they do when they find disease, or when disease becomes measured and, and visible? Um, in both cases, really, I think they, the, the practitioners lack treatment for what are deadly diseases. And so it puts a, a kind of poignancy on the ill and on the practitioners, that once they've become detected and measured and visible, there's not a happy ending. Um, and I've heard, you know, I've heard this comment that you read the paper and you feel fear. Um, in some ways, though, I think that once these things are, are visible and can be talked about, the mechanisms, well, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, that once they're, when, but to me, once they're visible, then actors can, other actors can be motivated or other levers can be pressed to bring money to bear, to bring power to bear, so that the Africans who are in the stories that become equipped, they become the scientists, they become the practitioners, they're, they have the medications and the technology um, to, to treat. Um, that, but but for, for me, I th to me, that's the most sort of important part of the story, is that without being able to, to number things or to describe them clearly, you're never going to push those levers. But once described, the levers, the levers are there. And Rosie's side, but I'd be curious to think that that's true. I think that that's very true. And then I think the question that that then brings up, at least for the anthropologist, you know, for the historian, is it's our job to then see the levers being pressed for what? The mindset of Global health, and before that, international health, um, is very much about disease transmission and blocking it for good reason. Mortality is what's counted for good reason. 
fertility, for good reason, all fine. But the experience of being ill is rendered invisible. And this is why, for example, you cannot get strong pain medicines by and large in Africa, even though patients are in often tremendous pain. And uh, morphine, for example, is an off-patent drug. It's incredibly cheap and could help a lot of people who are going to wind up being in the mortality statistic category. But that's not the only thing about them that matters right now. And maybe they're not going to transmit a disease to somebody else. But we, could, we still have something to offer them, or they still have something that they need and that they're seeking. So one thing I always say when I talk to oncologists now who are part of this global oncology enterprise is, it's wonderful that you want to bring oncology, more of it, to patients in Africa who need it. Please also bring anti-emetics. It's not okay that Africans have to vomit their way through it in cases where Americans would not. It just doesn't make any sense. So the numbers press the levers, and then we, as humanistic social scientists, who spend time on the ground have the ability to kind of amplify the things that we see that can't be rendered by the numbers to the people with the goods and services to offer to say, it's a slightly more expansive picture than this. And if you did this alongside that, I think that it would make a difference to people in human terms. So I guess that's um, what I would add. I agree very much with what you say about the boxes and the um, rendering things visible and the way that that can push the levers. I, I want to let other folks ask questions. I have things, thoughts about this, particularly with regard to um, the different conditions <coughs> where diseases are caused, but I'll leave that for the others. We'll talk more later. Okay. Um, something that struck me was that kind of the other side of this invisibility of certain diseases. Um, something that you mentioned in your paper was sort of an invisibility of power as well. So when you're talking about the drug companies and how they will give, um, basically give free drugs so that they can hide the fact that they're they're able to give free drugs, basically, so that they can keep people from being too upset about the price of drugs to actually demand better pricing and demand more access. Um, and so I feel like that perhaps is one of our main roles as people who are in the parts of the world that tend to have more power is to kind of expose where the power lies um, and, and make the power not invisible anymore so that so that the power itself can be targeted and not just the problems, but the solutions almost have to be sometimes dug up um, because they, they might be there, but those who are empowered don't want them to be shown. I would agree, and then I would say that it's also at the same time um, really difficult to know uh, what to do. For example, in this country, when we went through our big economic crisis starting in 2009, and a lot of people were losing their jobs and therefore their health insurance or they were going on COVID or what have you, some of the drug companies had these programs to help patients continue to maintain their drug regimens when their health care was dissolving and disappearing. And so you could access those drugs during the gap period before you hope to be covered again. Or uh, you look at these private public partnerships like Merck and the government of um, Botswana, or the gift of leave it to patients in this ward. And I, I, I guess I want to say that it it involves somehow threading the, the needle in order to expose what the relationships are of power because they're complex. And I do think that there's something good for people who need a drug to be able to get it. 
and I'm always worried about how to narrate that in a way that pr provides another model of how it could take place. For example, in this country, we really don't seem to be ready to have a system of universal care. I mean, we just, it doesn't appear to be the political will. I don't know what it is. It's very bizarre to me personally, but it really seems to be the case. Some people clearly are going to have to give up some of what they have in order for that to be the case. It's not true that if we just prevent live healthy lifestyles, health care will cost less. No, that's bullshit. <laughs> you know, it's very expensive to die when you're elderly and, and to live to be elderly and to be on 20 different drugs and to get a lot of tests and, and all of these things. So there are some of the ways in which uh, we in this country often talk about power in relationship to health as a demand for more. Don't deprive me of that mammogram. I don't trust you. We need more of those. Maybe, don't deprive me of that drug. I demand it. You give my kid that antibiotic while I'm in your office. I demand it. I don't trust you. And that um, has amp our, our, our politics around medicine and power are distorted in particular ways in our own country that I think has effects throughout the world. And the case of Gleevec in the 20-bed cancer ward in Botswana is directly uh, related to that. So it's hard to know exactly how to narrate that, how to expose those relationships of power without shining a bright light on ourselves and our own anxieties about our health. Uh, you know, if I were to make one recommendation to every single person in this room, it would be to go by Joe Dumas' new book, Drugs for Life and read it and think about how knowledge is produced in relationship to those relationships. Not because people are predatory, not because people are greedy, but because unfortunately this system has become untenable and it's not serving us well right now. So, uh, you know, I'm very sympathetic to what you say. The question is how to do that, I think is incredibly complicated right now. Just a quick comment on power. I think power comes in different colors, shapes, and sizes. Uh, people be empowered or you know, referring to the US versus in Africa and other places could be so different. And uh, one way, at least, you know, this is a common example in with it is the uh, fact that the power of governments can be applied for uh, as a negative force in terms of us. Um, you know, like, Cholera outbreaks, unless you have a war or earthquake like Haiti, if you have a cholera outbreak in a nation that you are governing, it's absolutely an, uh, an implier of a very bad government. Yes. <laughs> so often, you know, governments try to hide. Uh, at least in Zimbabwe is a very good example, and I know other nations, you know, at least in, uh, in one country case, uh, they had a cholera outbreak and they named it as SOVD, sudden onset of vomiting and diarrhea. <laughs> so anything formal and official, it was SOVD and we went to that country and there was a CDC person, so it was just on a dinner, on a private talk, I, I asked him, what does this SOVD mean? What he said, they have one word for it, cholera, But the government was absolutely hiding it, don't call it cholera, period, call it anything, Controls outbreak, but no. So it's the power could also, you know, you know I didn't get it. I'm sure there are a number of kids just because they didn't call it cholera. I'm sure there has been, you know, the, you know, it's highly contagious disease, and I'm sure the morbidity and mortality. It can be used uh, in a different ways. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is to this, but I'm going to go further two or three hours on the state. Maybe we'll all come back next year during our state formation and talk about the state because this is a big deal. I keep thinking about that general welfare clause I'm just kind of running through my head right now. But I want to go back here to John Perry and then right in front of you. Okay, uh, this is for Maria and for a historical mm -hmm. question. Um, I noticed you were talking about lines and I saw a few uh, footnotes to, the, to, to that effect. Uh, and I, I read that a few years ago and I was struck by how willing the, and ready the Belgians were to use uh, uh, spinal punctures for, for finding, uh, finding sleeping sickness. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that uh, the, the Germans uh, 
one more for uh, for the, the land stealers. And I was wondering, is that reflective of the Belgians had more of an extensive medical infrastructure on the ground versus the Germans, or what? Um, you know, what's uh, is there a comparison to be drawn between their two different respo uh, responses to sleeping sickness? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the the, the Thank you. The question of comparing different sleeping sickness um, research, treatment, and prevention programs um, in the 20th century is, is one that in some ways is in dire need of a really big, good, comprehensive book, but also um, the creation of that will lead to us really believing that these regimes are so completely different from one another, and I, I think there's a very good argument to be made that they're not as different. Um, when Mary Nez Lyons has this book called The Colonial Disease, which is a wonderful, wonderful book, um, about sleeping sickness, and she's really looking at, at the post World War One period, and talking about um, diagnosis with um, with lumbar punctures, with spinal taps, um, and then the the inclusion of people based on that result into a particular regime of, of treatment or disease prevention. Um, one of the reasons that the Belgians can do that is because they are, I mean, <laughs> uh, John is John is murmuring because she's awful, terrible, violent over here. Um, they they have a monopoly on violence in the nineteen in, in from the nineteen teens onward that um, that is not unprecedented or unparalleled but is extreme um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the Germans pre pre World War One, particularly in the Lakes region, are dealing with uh, with a completely different um, network of, of of power and a monopoly on violence. Their their medical apparatus, such as it is, is incredibly thin on the ground. There are very few station doctors, and the sleeping sickness campaign has. Um, um, the entire Burundian, now Burundian, and, and, and Tanzanian shore of Lake Tanganyika, um, I think eight total stations spread out every couple, every sort of 50 to 100 kilometers, and that is it. Um, they know, and this is very interesting, they, the German doctors know that they cannot go in and do lumbar punctures. People will not tolerate it, they will leave, they will flee, they will resist, they will not have it. And they know, especially the, the doctor who's working at, at, at Kigarama for, for most of the time, says, I can't do lumbar punctures, I can't do autopsies. You know, I can kind of mostly do blood draws, um, but, I, but I can't do those things because people, people will not come back for this months-long regimen of atoxyl that I want them to come back in. Um, and so I'm not doing those things. They know full well that lumbar punctures are the most reliable way of diagnosing sleeping sickness, but they, but they can and won't do them. And, they, and it's a very pragmatic decision not to do them. Um, but one thing just to kind of keep in mind as you're, as you're thinking about this, there's this sort of idea that the German colonial public health regime, particularly with regard to sleeping sickness, was, was much more willing to use experimental drugs, much more using to, to use atoxyl, which was known to not be a very good drug, um, and was more interested in drug treatment because the Germans are big pharma, right? They're where big pharma is born. Bayer and Paul Ehrlich and the whole lot. And that the, the British are doing depopulation and they're more ecologically minded and the Belgians are doing all sorts of terrible things, whatever they're <laughs> um, and, and it's important to, to recognize that the, the Belgians are using Intoxil in a way to, to sort of combat or to argue with German research. Um, the Germans are also depopulating particular areas and doing fly control. Um, there are British doctors, contemporaries of the German doctors that I'm looking with, that are trying on all sorts of different substances, not as much as other places, to see if maybe one of them will work and, and kill trypanosomes in the human body. And so, and so there's, a, there's a lot of movement, they're reading each other's work, they're getting papers sent back out from metropolitan institutions when they can, you know, and so they're, they're doing a lot of the similar things. But what they're capable of doing, what they, can, what they can compel people to consent to, like a spinal tap, which when you see the pictures of them, I mean, there are tons of pictures of them from the Belgian Congo too, which is a red flag, um, you know, are, are really, uh, I mean, it depends on how many guns and soldiers you have around and, and really how thick the apparatus of the state is on the ground. So, but thanks. I think you're going to be the last question. Okay, um, mine's kind of um, a more general question, but so we're talking about these policies of where governments want to control like the outside money put into the health ministry. Um, and so I'm sitting here thinking that that to me is like a um, backlash of kind of all of these activities like uh, the land feelers of uh, international NGOs, particularly Western NGOs, um, and how they've kind of um, thrown their money around. And I think it's kind of convenient that, and I guess maybe it would be convenient for us to say, well, you know, that could lead to corruption. 
instead of saying, well, maybe we should learn from our mistakes. And so I'm wondering, um, because NGOs are in Russia, like I do uh, research in the Russian Federation, and so they're starting to kick NGOs out for these kind of things. And so what are, I guess the question is, when are people going to start to learn? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, reading about colonial period and now NGOs are getting, I mean, you can't really blame health ministries for wanting to, I'm not saying that there's no corruption, but so, so what are, you know, when's it going to stop? What are we, you know, what can we do? Well, I think each policy or each moment is a response to seeing the problems that preceded. So there was a period in the 1990s, and so, okay, you know, we've talked about colonialism through multi, multiple periods. Then we talked about the beginnings of independence. We're just talking about Africa here in a moment, and this moment of kind of optimism and building of infrastructure and things. Then we've talked about the, you know, there was the oil crisis and the massive global recession and the subsequent shrinking of the state and the processes of privatization that came after that and the development of public-private partnerships, much of which, as it's don't correct, pointed out quite rightly was a reaction to the <coughs> failures of very large unwieldy states um, that had preceded that, some of which may have been Plutocratic, and that may have been part of it. And of course, this is an area that was a proxy for the Cold War, so as you can bring up Russia, we will just throw that in there as well. Um, and then there was a period where there wasn't a lot of money in international health, at least for Africa. It was going, not surprisingly, to part of the world where you work, right? Yeah. It was going to, to different areas. And then there was a kind of moral crisis that was produced in part by activists saying, hey, over here, and now we have a massive global health apparatus that is an order of magnitude unprecedented. It's not your old international health wrapped up in a new package. This is tens of billions of dollars moving uh, each year. There are billions of human beings at stake, tons and tons of money, technologies, and people moving around, and it does answer the period of neglect and intensive privatization and dispossession that came before it, and now it has problems. Mm -hmm. And so there will be, and there is ongoing, some look at what those problems are. Part of it is this need to fold things into the state. You can't have 27 NGOs that do overlapping similar things and duplicate themselves with no aggregation of knowledge being produced out of it so that levers can't be pushed by people within the Ministry of Health. You can't have a state that can't be accountable to its citizens because they're running over here, they've got 15 people on ARVs and that thing is full and it's only a five-year project so when it, when it holds up what will happen there. So things are trying to be folded into the state, but at the same time now we have a, a, a economic, political, intellectual formulation that has an imperative to spend a tremendous amount of money. Mm -hmm. And that pushes it forward in these great arterial like flows of resources that are really hard to operate in a finesse way. And <coughs> smart people look at it, many of them Africans, some of them outsiders who work within there, and they try to reformulate and finesse it, and they will create new problems, but they will fix some of those, and then a new moment will happen. I mean, this is part, I think your question gets right to the heart of what Chris is, is asking. The, the, these are protean formulations. The environment moves, the fly belts move, the... Uh, the problems on the ground move, the states shift, and part of our job as people who are interested in those things is to represent the interests of the people on the ground by looking as carefully and as closely as we can and saying, this is, this is what I'm hearing and this is what I'm seeing, and people at different levels understanding, hearing, and seeing what they have, and then together trying to figure out a way to communicate with one another, but I don't think that Finally, we're going to learn from our mistakes because that would mean that the world was standing still. And that's just not 
It's not possible. These are different states than they were 10 years ago. They've responded to those mistakes, aside from the fact that they're in motion in all kinds of other ways. We're in a different global economy than we were 10 years ago. We're in a, and so it's always going to be that. That's always going to be the question, but it always has to continue to be asked. It's a good question. It's the asking of it has to be productive of something. I'm going to make a final comment, and um, which is, is along those same lines. I've been thinking about this: that, that um, there ain't no perfect future. There is no, there is no utopia That's down the pike. It's a constant. There is going to be, and this is why we do history. History is this constant motion through time, and that's what we have in front of us. There is, and the issue is, the, the perfect system will be the flexible system that can deal with. You know, shifts and changes and directionalities that we aren't sure about. Um, but, you know, so, and, and I would just put a pitch in, that's what we do for history. Um, that's what we do as a fact. We look, look at what happened, but we don't assume there's going to be any perfect future. Um, I want to do two things. First, I want to advertise that we will have a session in two weeks on... Is it called sudden onset of vomiting and diarrhea? Yes. Uh, sudden onset of diarrhea <laughs> exactly. in the, Russia and the Soviet Union, i.e., in cholera in the Soviet Union, uh, and, and Russia, but basically 1870 to. 92 to 27. Okay. Okay. 1892 to 1927. John Davis will be here in two weeks, and Nick Breifogel, who had to rush home, will be the yeah. comment. And I want to thank uh, two groups of people. I want to thank our our presenters and commentators who collectively have done a wonderful job. And I want to thank the whole group for coming and being one of the best, the best, this is, there have been very high standards set in this seminar over the last year and a half, but this has been one of the best sessions. So thank you very much.